I'm honored and humbled to be here today. Um, a lot of times when you go to events or different programs, you kind of think, okay, are we going to have a friendly crowd? Are these people that are going to be on our side? Today is that day that I don't have to worry about that. <laughs> and I hope it's not the last until November the 6th. Um, our guest speaker today, we know that she is on our side and very thankful that she has decided to come to Michigan to give us some knowledge as to how to help fight this fight. Uh, even though she's small in size, she's big in stature, <laughs> and her story truly speaks for itself. And after she speaks, I hope that you all feel that you have a shot of adrenaline and enough energy that is going to give us the charge to make it until November. Ms. Barbara R. Arnwine has served as Executive Director of the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Law uh, since 1989, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that was formed in 1963 at the request of President John F. Kennedy to address racial discrimination. Ms. Arnwine is internationally renowned for contributions on critical justice issues, including the passage of the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1991. A graduate of Scripps Univer College and Duke University School of Law, she continues to champion civil rights issues nationally and internationally in the areas of housing, fair lending, community development, employment, voting, education, environmental justice, and more. A prominent leader in the civil rights community, Ms. Arnwine's international instrumental work also includes international civil, human, and women's rights legislation. Under her leadership, the Lawyers Committee continues to monitor the United States compliance with the United Nations human rights standard and treaty obligation. Ms. Arnwine is a prominent leader of election protection, the nation's largest nonpartisan voter protection coalition, launched in 2004 to assist historically disenfranchised persons to exercise the fundamental right to vote. She continues to fight to protect our fundamental rights and democracy. She has been a true champion for civil, human and women's rights, and we are honored to have her with us today. Please join me in giving her a great Michigan welcome. Please welcome Ms. Barbara Arnwine. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Anita. Thank you so much, not only for that introduction, but for everything that you do. For that grueling work, it's nothing like being in the lion's den every day. And so I really want to just thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's what a pleasure it is to be in Michigan. Not necessarily on a rainy and thundering day, but that just shows who you are that you are present. I am so pleased to be here, and I wanted to thank you for coming. It's great to be here for this in a pardon convening. And I love the theme that we're talking about today, energizing, engaging, and winning. Hey, um, you see, now when we are in the fight that George has done such a brilliant job talking about, what we need is to bring together passionate, civic-minded, and engaged citizens with vision to energize and empower one another. You know, I want to start off by thanking you because we are in Michigan. And I'm so reminded that Michigan is the ground zero of so many fights. We have watched you fight now for quite a while against this emergency manager's law. We have watched you fight and give us the cases that we have to deal with on Gruder and Gratz. We've had to see Michigan proposition number two, banning affirmative action, and fortunately, because you fight, we were able to put that on hold by the appellate court ruling. We also want to thank you for your fight on Trayvon Martin. Every one of you who put on a hoodie, posted that picture, said I am Trayvon Martin, got to give you a credit because that is the essence of our fight, that we can lift up a dead 17-year-old boy killed for just being black, walking in a white gated community, and being told that he didn't belong and shot and killed. You see, our coalition, 
The fight that we're all about as progressives is about, as George has said, transforming and changing this nation. So Trayvon getting Zimmerman charged, fighting to get justice for him is just not the end of the story, right? So much of our battles are always the beginning of the story. And this story about the fight for Trayvon Martin, if you pick up the next, the current on the newsstand right now edition of Essence Magazine, you will see a special feature on Trayvon Martin. The Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law had a lot to do with this feature. It talks a lot about what is the work that we need to be doing now to stop stand your ground laws, to get them repealed and get them off the, off the books. It talks about how do we train police so they stop killing unarmed black men. It talks about how do we bring police to, to be under control through civilian review boards, independent civilian review boards. You see, there's so many strategies that we need in this country, and we can only do it if we educate ourselves and then educate everybody out there. So I just want to thank you because you've been there and you're in this fight. Also, this last week, we've seen one of the most important battles of our lifetime taking place. And it just shows you the, the pendulum that we do deal with when we talk about fighting for racial justice, fighting for any kind of justice for anybody. And that is, we've seen two things happen in one week that were phenomenal. One was the horrible passage in North Carolina of the anti-gay rights, marriage rights amendment. But then we also saw President Obama come out and state his support for equal marriage rights for all citizens. So you see, you see, it's that, it, that's our reality. We never stop fighting because we lose anything because we know that every battle, every single battle is just one more step in our ability to win this war because the truth of the matter is that as progressives, the battle is in our favor. It may not seem like it, but it is in our favor, and we need to always remember that, that it is ours to win. You see, my major message today is going to be about voting rights, and I know that there was a great session held here on it, so I'm not going to try to go too much into repeating everything that you've heard, but I did want to bring you a message, because in that message is some encouragement. You see, we are in the battle of our lifetimes. I'm talking about the fight for racial justice, social justice, democracy, and voting rights in America. Think about this, everyone. In, two, in November of 2010, 25 million Americans who voted in 2008 did not show to the polls. The average congressional race in America was decided by less than 2,000 votes. There was, we may have still been in our post-Obama drama. We may still have been, you know, trying to figure out, you know, how to get the administration to be what we wanted it to be. We may have been in all of this crisis, but the reality was that when those 25 million people did not come to vote, the people who, got, who were able to sneak in to, to the state legislatures, sneak in to Congress, decided to take their Neanderthal-minded civic views and impose on us a new regimen of laws to make sure that those 25 million voters would be permanently excluded from the electorate. So part of what they did was immediately, as soon as they took office in January, instead of dealing with education rights, instead of dealing with jobs, instead of dealing with all the other issues, they immediately started passing voter suppression laws. And they did that because they knew 
that in this country, 11%, some 20 million people who voted in 2008 let these photo ID, governmentally issued photo ID requirements. They knew that if they could shut down our grassroots voter registration, that they could dominate the electorate. They had a vision that says we are going to destroy and permanently oppress the people who we believe are against our agenda. So who's in the crosshairs of this battle? Who's in the crosshairs of these snipers? They are African Americans, Latinos, Asian Americans, Native Americans, and no doubt the number one target, students. These are the people who are seen as progressive on social and economic issues. These are the people who they fear will vote them out the next election when they show up for the presidential elections. These are the people who they had as their targets and their collateral damage were, of course, seniors and people with disabilities. So in the 40 states of this country, in 50, we have 50 states and 40 of those states, they introduced voter suppression laws. The largest voter suppression effort since Reconstruction in this country. You see, what I always like to remind us as progressives is that we have always in this country been engaged in a fight of two visions, a fight of two fight, I mean, you know, two dynamics, a racial, you know, dynamic, all kinds of, you know, gender dynamics, but there's always this fight of two visions. And it's one is a vision of a white nation based on male privilege for the top elite. That that's what this nation should be about, that's what its goals should be about, that's who it should serve. That vision has not faded. Don't for a minute think that we are in some country where people don't hold dearly to that vision. But there's also been, and, and another part of that vision of course was that blacks and Native Americans and now Latinos and Asians are seen as subhumans to be exploited for profit. Of course, the horrible Dred Scott case that said a black man had no rights to which a white man had to respect. But this fight is now before us in a different way, even though it's the same battle. So every time you hear people talking about, we want to take our country back, back, always say to where. Because this fear of demographic change, this nostalgia for the white America of the 1950s, where, and you know where we were in the beginning of the 1950s, is now rearing its ugly head again. If you've been following Matthew Vadum, who's one of the leading conservative thinkers in this country, you will see that he published a piece after piece on why the poor shouldn't have the right to vote. And he even says that giving the poor the right to vote is like giving criminals burglary tools. That's what they think. Says that these people will only vote for social and economic policies that will try to you know, socialize America. And that it's important to keep this electorate out of the voting machines. There are vision, however, has also been there from the beginning. And that is a vision of a diverse, inclusive, equal for all, culturally open, and economic just society. That is the vision that we have to always cling to. Teach our children. Make sure it is the mantra of our society. Because that's the vision that will, in fact, overcome all of these fights. In the current landscape, as you can see from the map of shame that's playing uh, in the background here, is that we have had 40 states, as I mentioned, have introduced these laws. 
Nine states have been successful in passing these laws, Florida, Kansas, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Wisconsin, Alabama, Pennsylvania, Mississippi, and Virginia did a kind of slight version, so did Rhode Island. And what have these laws been? We talked about restricting voter ID, voter registration, voter intimidation and deceptive practices, proof of citizenship laws, and getting rid of early voting, and I'm sad to hear that Michigan has no such thing as early voting, felony disenfranchisement laws, all of that. But you see, I just want to tell you one little secret, that when the forces came together and said that we're going to control and dominate the electorate by passing these voter suppression laws, they counted on many things. One is that the public would be inattentive. They counted on deception, being able to say voter fraud, voter fraud, voter fraud. They counted on the pure, raw exercise of their power. They counted on all of that. But you see, there's one thing that they didn't count on. One thing that they missed. One thing that they totally underestimated. And that was us. You see, they didn't count on us. They forgot about us. So they said those little resource-deprived progressives, those little fight among themselves civil rights groups, that they can't put, do nothing. You know, we got the legislature. We have the power, but they underestimated us. You see, what they didn't realize <laughs> They didn't realize that we know how to come together in battle. They realized that when we're in a war, we know how to give each other some more. And what they didn't count on is that we would go into Wisconsin and we would fight and win in the courts there and stop the law. They didn't know that Barbara Arnwine would sit across from the Attorney General of the United States and slap the map of shame in his face and say that this happened on your watch. What you gonna do? And they didn't think about the fact that he would then go and give a speech in Austin, Texas, and that he would then, that the Department of Justice would then deny pre-clearance of, the of the voter suppression laws in South Carolina, deny pre-clearance, that is, approval of the voter suppression laws under Section 5 of the Voting Rights in Texas. He, they didn't know that those two laws would be put on hold and that we would get them to join us in a lawsuit in Florida to fight the voter suppression laws there. They didn't see that. They didn't see that in Alabama, that in Mississippi, that the NAACP and other groups would talk to folks and that even when the vote came out of the ballot initiative, that when 82% of all white voters approved the ballot initiative, they didn't, and they were saying, of course, all the time, and they still tell this lie that everybody loves voter ID. They didn't tell you that 76% of all blacks voted against the voter ID law. And because of that, we're going to stop that law in that state. And we're going to put it on hold. We're going to also, we put the Alabama law is now being put on hold. So in essence, of their, quote, nine victories, six of them we put on hold. You see, that's us. That's who we are when we fight. That's what we have to do. We cannot sit around. And then we weren't just content to do that. You see, colorchange.org said there's a thing called ALEC. They, they are behind the American Legislative Change Council. They are behind the Stand Your Ground laws, and they're behind these voter suppression laws. And they started calling them out. Every corporation that has been supporting ALEC, they call them out Coca-Cola. They call them out Pepsi-Cola. They call them out Intuit. They call them out, and each one of them said, oops, I'm out. <laughs> I'm out. They started calling out state legislators who were being trained by ALEC, congressional legislators. And they said, I'm out. You see, there's value in pulling the cover off. There's value in truth-telling, as George was saying. There's value in our fight, because when we fight, we win. It's when we sit back and do nothing that we lose. You see, you see, 
You see, the other thing that we did was also there had been a ballot initiative passed in Arizona, and we went into the Arizona federal courts and fought against that in initiative, saying it violated the National Voter Registration Act, that they couldn't have this great proof of citizenship requirement that was basically targeting Latinos and Native Americans to keep them out of the polling booths. And people said, ah, oh, lawyers committee, what in the heck are you doing wasting your money? Uh, you can't win that case. Guess what? The Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals just upheld our case. And we have now put that law on hold. We have been suing states. We sued six states now and just won last week a settlement against the state of Georgia because of the failure to implement Section 7 of the NVRA, which requires every state public assistance office to register people to vote. Well, guess what? They weren't doing it. Most states, they don't do it. So we've been working with Project Vote and Demos and others to bring that fight. And guess what? As a result of our victories in state after state after state, over one million new voters have been registered. You see, you know, folks, we are the solution. We are the answer for these times. We have the ability to make the change that has to be happened. That is so re necessary in these times. We got a model as we look at this new Jim Crow, as uh, my sister Michelle Alexander likes to say, that we got to understand you know, what we're up against with these voter suppression laws and this fight. And I know that you've been talking about the fight here in Michigan. And I want to thank you know, Jocelyn Benson who, and for her fight and when she, <laughs> what she's done in this whole struggle. And so many great personal stories. And we got so much to go on, and there are so many horrible stories of people who have been oppressed through these laws. But in Michigan, we do need to fight, folks. We have these horrible bills, and even if they pass, that's not the end of the story. I want to remind you again that our obligation is when they say we're going to pass voter ID, do you think for a minute that we have sat back and said just because they passed the stupid law in Pennsylvania that we wouldn't sue, we have. But also, we've said to people in Tennessee and people to, in other states that what we're going to still do is, even though we put these laws on hold, we don't know what the eventual outcome will be of all of this. So what we've done is that we've also said we're going to get people their IDs. And we said, guess what? You're trying to knock people out of the, off the registration rolls? Well, we're going to make it even harder because we're going to register more voters. You see, we have to have that kind of strong, strong fight. And in here in Michigan, I saw that last week that the Detroit County Clerk indicated that she doesn't even have the money to even administer an election uh, because of all these cutbacks. So what I want to end on is saying a couple of things. We're not just in this fight to be on the defense. We can transform radically our American democracy. We can save and transform it by doing one really important thing. And that is we must pass election reform that opens up the electorate. So we got to pass voter registration modernization, which some people call automatic voting, where you can, as I love to tell George, when my son graduated from high school, I was so surprised that literally four months later, in the mail was his selective service card. <laughs> he didn't have to do one thing. He didn't have to look for a register. He didn't have to go down to no department of, you know, of elections. He didn't have to do anything. It came in the mail. Why can't his voting card come to the mail? That's what we, where we have to go. We have to shut down 
All of these practices where registration is used to deny people their rights to vote, where they're purged because they have the, their homes foreclosed and they got to move from one county to the other. They're, they're purged because people use these caging abilities and other things to try to knock people off the electorate. So it's critical to us that we be about positive reform, that we have this whole thing with true to vote has said, and true to vote, if you don't know them, are you know, patri uh, these Tea Party groups that have said that they're going to put a million challengers in every black and Latino precinct to scare the hell out of people, right? Uh, but to intimidate voters and challenge voters. We need to make sure that in every state that we have enough people mobilized to go to those same polls and protect voters. You see, we've got to be about that. So our election protection agenda, you got a flyer on it. I'm not going to go into it uh, other than to say that that's key, that you be part of election protection, 150 organizations, 200 law firms, 10,000 lawyers. We need you. We need you. We need you. We need to have a straight-wide coalition here that we can work with that we know who's in charge, that there's an ability to circulate information, do trainings, be part of this fight. We need to be able to maximize technology. We're going to have a mobile app that's coming out that people can use to find out where their polling places are. Are they registered? All the information that they need, what's going on with the laws and, when, and the alerts on things that they need to know. We are working on all of this. And we are the solution people. Get the Agata ID report. Get all this information as we close. And I want to remind you that as we seek these voting reforms, we need early voting here in Michigan. We need early voting. Don't, don't give up. We need election day registration. Look what it did in North Carolina. Look what it did. We need to ban and outlaw deceptive practices in voter intimidation. We need to do these things. We can do it. You see, remember that we are the answer. We promote the vision. We build the bridge from one bad year to the next great year. We build the bridge from one bad century to the next great century. We build the bridge from the America of inequality privilege and denial to the America of inclusiveness, diversity, economic justice, environmental justice. We build that bridge. The future is ours. Thank you.